Welcome to Access to Art, an ongoing series presented by the Minneapolis Television Network to cover the breadth and depth of art activities in our fine city. We're at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts today, the site of Telebration put on by the North Star Storytelling League. We're going to go up and see some of the events in a little bit. But first, we're downstairs near the coffee gallery where there were storytellers today, and we're by the Minnesota Center for Book Arts in front of what is technically a correspondence art show. Artists from all over the country, even the world, were invited to send their interpretation or image of Day of the Dead. And let me mention a good friend of mine, Alan Vandenberg in Santa Barbara, California, submitted one of the winning entries over there. So everybody connects in different ways. Our first segment today is about a Day of the Dead celebration that was, let me check, pr uh, presented at the Institute of Cultural Culture and Education at 41st and Bloomington, sponsored by the Mercado. And the Day of the Dead is held the day after Halloween. And people honor the deceased, unlike we do. They don't just mourn, they tend to party. Here it is, the Day of the Dead. it is. It is a spheroid of literature. It is an entire globe of books. 
This indeed is a concrete poem. It's a substantive, non-literal, non-traditional, concrete poem. This is the poetry of tomorrow. And this is exactly the sort of non-traditional stuff that excites me about the language and a lot of the things that go on here at Telebration. People aren't quite mimicking or putting on a costume to look like this globe, but some of the stories told here today approach totally new interpretations of narrative. Very exciting stuff. Our next section is about the 7th Annual Northeast Clay Tour, which included the involvement of nine galleries and studios, including Clay Squared to Infinity, 212 Pottery, Ernest Miller, who's in the Northrop King Building. And let's take a look at what's cooking in the kiln. It's just it's so immediate. You touch it, you form it, you shape it. I mean, it all happens right there with your hands. Uh, the shapes that I make are, you know, kind of influenced by everyday things I see. It's a new process, every, every bowl, every shape that you might try. I like the sense of volume. Mm -hmm. Trapping the volume inside is kind of fun. Today we're having the seventh annual um, Northeast Minneapolis Clay Tour. Well, it's just kind of creating public awareness of clay in Northeast. Uh, Ernest Miller was involved and uh, Jim Brown and Josh uh, looking for uh, I guess another art celebration that really specialized just in clay. It's definitely a very diverse community as far as styles. I think uh, as potters we sometimes there's, we're kind of a close-knit group so that makes it easy for us to get together and have a few meetings and say hey let's let's open up our studios together to pool our resources for a nice postcard and I'll be open for uh, a weekend. And I am the proprietor of Clay Square to Infinity with my wife, and it's a handmade tile shop and polymer clay studio. Uh, we came around the corner here some seven years ago where Northeast wasn't quite um, what it is now, and we found a metal building, and um, it looked like a nice venue to make a pottery shop. Not only do we make it here, but we also showcase about uh, 20 to 30 other tile makers throughout the region. We have a directory of tile makers. Whether you have an Arts Across Bungo, a Victorian home, a contemporary home, we sort of match you up with tile makers that make the kind of work for your home. There we have our colors that people can choose from, and then different designs that they go through, whether they're pattern designs or design, painted designs. We do a lot as well with historic patterns. Another big part of what we do is mosaics. Uh, so people come in and they just play around and just get their hands to be able to dig right in there and, and just, it's just like a candy store. I really don't think there's anything that, that says working with your hands better than working with clay. So I don't think anybody really becomes the best that you can be, you know. You're just continually trying to stretch. Well, I'm working with porcelain, so it kind of feels like throwing a cream cheese. If you can imagine that. <laughs> and water's our friend. The water's there to keep the clay slick, but you also got to move with the clay, but confidently with it. The better you get at making pots, the more you like it, I think. And the wheel can be seductive, too. Just the whole spinning motion and how easily the clay can just move. And then I'll just uh, get the direction for the wall, this first initial throw. So what I'm doing now is slowly just grabbing the clay at the bottom lifting it and pulling it into a cylinder. Most everything starts out as a basic general cylinder. I call it engineering a pot, maybe. It's one of my favorite parts is making the general cylinder and then you come in and you start opening it up. Kind of the clay starts to come alive. So you're pretty much done now, except that I can never stay away from putting texture into it. I can't help it. I love texturing, I love something looking uh, handmade. Uh, the first thing I do anytime I go into a, a kitchen store is look for something I can use on clay. I always look at the back side when you're throwing like this. You know, you're always looking at your lines in the back. And then in the back we have our National Jury Tile Show. Our studio is pretty simple. We roll out the clay on the plaster table uh, using slat boards. We will use to use those and just a basic uh, standard, very nice uh, rolling pin, or we use an extruder, which is basically a big Play-Doh machine. And then we set them on to the, the plaster, and overnight we'll put a glaze on them, and then we put it in the, in the kilns. And these are all the colors that we use. Uh, a lot of blues, a lot of greens. These are the babies right here. This is our regular reduction kiln. Um, it's a nice size. It's probably about a week's worth of work. 
really all of Northeast is just amazing to me. Uh, what we've been able to accumulate here, uh, really quite by accident. We like people coming out and visiting the studios. We like to talk about pots and uh, you can come and see our work. It's been uh, a great experience for me to be a part of this whole uh, area and I hope it continues to the, and I can't throw anymore and I can't imagine when that'll be. Well, it's a beautiful, brisk Saturday here at Telebration in Minneapolis, and we're taking a little break from the activities so we can speak with my mom. Holy smokes, it's my mom, who co-starred in Osama Kincaid, Painter of Terrorism, with me. Mom, why on earth are you here today other than the fact that I made you come? Because I know a lot of the artists, and I enjoy listening to them. Well, if you enjoy listening to them, what are you reading the stories in the paper for? Because I'm taking a break right now. I've been working. It's exhausting listening to all these crazy people tell their crazy stories. Are you going to be in a show today? Uh, I don't think so, but you never know what you're going to do. We're doing a program, Stories from the Edge, and to make it really from the edge, in fact, we are putting my mom on stage at 4 o'clock. Are you ready? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I think that's a good enough endorsement. Thank you, Mom. Get back to hearing the stories, and thank you for watching. The Minnesota Center for Book Arts is a nonprofit organization dedicated to, well, everything related to the books, getting more people interested in bookmaking, keeping alive uh, traditional bookmaking ways and means. Behind me is a very severe looking guillotine, and I bet that can shave a hundredth of an inch, if not finer, off any piece of paper or cardstock. And you know what ruins a blade like that? routinely just cutting with regular pieces of paper. So don't come here and mess that up. You want to come here when people can tell you what to do with this equipment. And one event that happens, more of a fundraiser for MCBA, is Waze Goose, which traditionally marks the end of summer and the beginning of the time of year when if you want to work, you'll be working by candlelight. Let's take a look at these rooms when they're full of people. This is the cartoonist conspiracy, and, and I'm a cartoonist, and these are my fellow cartoonists, and we're doing kind of a jam here. Is this, is this a way goose, or is this a jam? I think this whole thing is the way's goose. Okay. So we're just, we're just drawing, a, it's a stream of consciousness thing, and uh, hopefully it'll all work together. I'm Jeff Rathermill. I'm the artistic director at Minnesota Center for Book Arts. Uh, the term waste goose really def uh, relates to an old, old term for a printer's party. Um, way back in the 16th, 15th centuries, the, uh, the old printer, the, the head printer, would provide a party for um, his apprentices at the end of the summer where they would be getting ready, they would do a cleanup and then he would give them tokens so that they go out and uh, be able to go to the local bars, basically, to go down and, and have a beer at the, at the tavern. I think this is about our um, fifth or sixth Ways Goose that we've had. Um, so as a part of tonight's uh, celebration, we have uh, demonstrations in paper making, we have printing on the old iron press, we have Jean Formo, who is a calligrapher, uh, we have Andy Farkas, who's an artist in residence, uh, doing work and showing some of his recent work that he's done with us. We also have the International Cartoonist Conspiracy, demonstrating some of their uh, drawing and cartooning that they do.
Andy Farkas. I've uh, been working here at the Book Center for, I guess, about two weeks. They had me up uh, as an artist in residence. So I proposed a project um, to do, and uh, it's, the project I proposed is, is a book. It's called Hmm. Uh, it's about a bear who thinks he's a tree. I'll show you the whole book. So the, the bear wakes up one morning and to find that uh, uh, he feels twiggy up on his head because it's itchy. And then he hears a bird singing um, up there and he thinks, well, trees make that sound, so he thinks he's a tree. And, uh, well, and I guess everything that goes along with that, he, um, he goes off to the forest to try and be a tree and, you know, so he'll stand like with his arms up and um, he'll stay as still as he can. Anyway, it's, um, I don't know, I like the story. I hope you, uh, hope you get a chance to read it. Um, so anyway, I, I don't want to spoil it. I'm not sure, I mean, I can, it's much better when you read it rather than having me just tell everybody what it is. So maybe come into the Book Art Center and, you know, read the story. Well, part of the celebration is to recognize on both a, a traditional and modern sense how people tell stories and use stories to either advance different mythologies, histories, beliefs, or stories that for whatever reason, at least long ago, couldn't even be printed. But if you ask me, you know, stories are the kids telling you what happened to the homework, or maybe it's a good guide, and maybe it's a good lawyer, and maybe it's a good witness at times. To me, anybody trying to fess up to something or deny something is actually an excellent storyteller. Here at Telebration, they widen the net each year to include more and more of this type of story, and we're going to see some of that in the background today. She said, when you heard I was coming, you did nothing but doubt. And your words were sharp, like pins and needles, and I give them back to you. And the trees gasped, and their broad leaves were gone. Every limb was covered with sharp needles. She said, you will watch and wait all, all winter and keep watch over these other trees. But she turned at last to the tamarack and said, but because you told me the truth, I give you also a gift. You may sleep through the winter. Sassy, the right place, has been dedicated to making literary arts accessible to a more diverse community since 1993. Recently, they've been hosting the Women of Color readings at Patrick's Cabaret. Our next segment focuses on a recent installment titled Short Hot Mamas, an incandescent night of powerful memoir poetry featuring Carolyn Holbrook and Sharon Suzuki Martinez. Welcome everyone to tonight's reading, Short Hot Mamas. How could we resist coming out for that? Short Hot Mamas, an incandescent night of powerful memoir and poetry. Our readers tonight, Sharon Suzuki Martinez. She's a founding member of the Loose Leaf Poetry Series. She will be reading from her book manuscript, Bright Shining Flying Objects. She grew up in Hawaii. Caroline Holbrook founded Sassy, The Right Place, in 1993. I don't know how she finds the time and the energy to do so much and give so much to the community. So I'm honored to introduce both Carolyn Hobart and Sharon Suzuki Martinez. Powerless, ex-offender, convicted felon, seeks employment. Baby's mama screaming on him because the rent's late and the baby needs shoes. Powerless, ashamed to tell the shrink he didn't have the money for the meds that kept his bipolar disorder in check. Powerless, ashamed to call his narcotics anonymous sponsor or anyone else for that matter, including the Almighty, to ask for help. It only took a few weeks for the positive energy Stevie had built up over, the few, over a few short years of living productively to dissipate. He began to spiral out of control, sinking into that familiar black hole of drugs and alcohol. And on November 20th, 2001, two months and nine days after the attacks on the World Trade Center, a year and ten days before he was sentenced to the federal penitentiary, my number one son imploded. But by now, I had been talking so much about robbing a bank that I convinced myself to do it. So I pulled into a convenience store and stole a pair of those dark mirror sunglasses so no one could tell what I was looking at. And then it was off to the bank. Shame, 
shame buried just beneath the epidermis, the top layer of his skin, ready to jump out and bite him in the ass at a moment's notice. So I thought, I'd better get to detox. But as I was rolling through Rosemont, I caught a glimpse of a sign that said TCF, T TCF Bank, Grand Open. Very impulsively, I pulled into the parking lot. Then I wrote a note demanding money. The Rosemont newspaper reported that Steve used a threatening note and the suggestion of a gun to walk out with, the, with an undisclosed amount of money. Witnesses helped identify him. As he ran out of the bank, he had shoved the money down his pants and a dye pack exploded. I hear the dye pack explode, pow! And I see this red substance cover the front of his pants as he climbs into the truck. Traces of the red dye had burned through the tan leather seats. Now picture this, Mom. Here I am blazing down a dirt road with my pants and underwear down around my ankles, kicking up a thick cloud of dust behind me and tossing all of the destroyed, banded bundles of money that I couldn't salvage out the window. He has to keep moving before the cops catch up with him, but where will he go? I hooked up with my dope man when I got back into town, and I had promised him a month before that I would take him home to Detroit to see his mom for Thanksgiving. God was not willing to let me go through with my plans for the next 24 hours. And right around 6 a.m., as we were pressing through Gary, Indiana, and were about to head into Illinois, I got so groggy that I had no fight left in me, no energy. I turned the wheel over to the youngster and was about to nod off to sleep. And when I looked out the windshield, what I saw was like something you only see in movies. I swear, Ma, Wisconsin State Troopers and Federal Marshals were everywhere. November 10th, 2002, my eldest son was sentenced to 10 years in the federal penitentiary. 10 years hard time and maximum security. Shame has amazing power. Shame stored in his genetic memory, embedded in his DNA. Shame that started when his great 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 grandparents were shackled and forced to walk across the door, walk through the door of no return, locked up on ships that carried them through the middle passage, shitting and puking all over themselves and their relatives, friends and neighbors chained close together like they were in a can of sardines, stripped of their history, their identity, their language, their religion. Shame passed down to him through three or four generations of family members who suffered the pain and humiliation that started with slavery and mutated into deep anger and self-hatred, one of the effects of the phenomenon known as post-traumatic slave syndrome. Mall of America. It's an army of squirrels moving across mountains, swimming across rivers. Who will stop them? Not I, said the chicken. Not I, said the government. Not I, said USA Today. The grayish menace pushed forever, forward ever unstoppable, like the killer bee pioneers who swarmed before them. They splashed across the Colorado. They scampered across the Rockies. They capered across the plains. They pulverized Phoenix, the atomic clock at Fort Collins, the high culture of Des Moines. They devastated oak forests, apple trees, beer, chips, hot dogs, ice cream, and our love for all you can eat. They capsized boats on the Mississippi, carrying tragic men who thought they were poets and bags of sand. Nothing stopped the bright-eyed wave until they beheld the Mall of America. Now it's just a matter of time for the gray-haired horde to consume, grow weary, and go back to wherever they came from. When life knifes you in the soul to heal your innocence, go back to your roots. When your homeland lies broken by embittering winds, go back to your roots, where tales shimmer with heroes who might, in the light of day, play as squirrels or kelp tryst girls at the sea and night. They are mirrors who always remember our original beautiful faces of fur, feathers, or leaves. When time's sun burns you down, drink deep from stories, sweet ground, and go back to your roots. Since there is a little lull in the activity here November 11th at Telebration, located at Minnesota Center for Book Arts, we could get a word in, I believe, with Paula Reed Nan Caro, who's kind of a force behind all of this, a longtime storyteller in the Twin Cities, and now attending to all the information needs. And I'm going to ask you the broadest possible question, so you can say anything you want. What's up with Telebration, and why is it happening? What's up with Telebration? Well, I, I 
have to say I am not the force behind this. That's the first thing. There is a big, there are a lot of people uh, that are involved. And I'm not actually one of the first uh, founding North Star members. North Star started about 1999, I think, and I just actually moved here. But um, uh, North Star is a uh, small group. It's a volunteer group of people who get together to tell stories. And uh, we have a lot of different venues, um, different places where we tell. There is a lot going on in the Twin Cities. This is really the biggest celebration event in the country. I don't know if anybody really? know, anybody knows that. Yeah, And um, we have stuff going on free all day, and then uh, an evening concert at night, which is, um, uh, except for me, which is really professional people. They're, they're all big names. <laughs> they're big names. They're big names. They're big names. And, uh, and we just want everybody to come and, and hear um, stories and learn how to tell stories themselves and uh, enjoy themselves. Well, thus wraps another episode of Access to Art, which you can see on Channel 17 every Tuesday night, 8.30, in the fine city of Minneapolis that is so thick and busy around the clock with all sorts of unexpected aesthetic activity. You just got to tune in more often. See you next time. Kadzooks, Robert, Robert Rousseau, son of Richard Rousseau, a premier storyteller and heavily involved in celebration. Well, he's enlisted the support of his son. And you're, you're at all of Richard's gigs, aren't you? Uh, most of the time, yes. The only story I do have is kind of an anecdote, so. Okay, you should go for it. Uh, okay, um, so uh, this kid wants to buy a parrot, right? So he goes to a, uh, a pet store, all right. and the owner says, well, here's a parrot, and if he doesn't learn anything in three days, then uh, you can uh, bring him back, no charge. So first day, I was driving by a uh, tree, and there's a cat stuck up it, and uh, they're like, throw up a rope and get him down. So at the end of the day, boy says to the parrot, what'd you learn today? Throw up a rope and get him down. Throw up a rope and get him down. So second day, I gotta think about this, it's been a while. Uh, they are going fishing, and uh, they're fishing, and then somebody says, ooh, I got a big one, ooh, I got a big one. Oh, no, that's the third one. I'm sorry. It's been a while. <laughs> well, anyway, at the end of the story, some uh, religious people get offended, and uh, a woman gets hit with a book. What happened in that story? <laughs>